praise to the Most High, the Creative Creators, the Frame in the Shape of All. Hey, hey, love and light to my loved ones, the copper color faces, my melanations, and to the seekers of truth from other persuasions. Uh, hadn't seen me for a while, and I had a few production setbacks and some re editing I have to do. I'd like to uh, just give a shout out to those who checked on me, asked about me. Appreciate that. That was love. But when you don't hear from me, when you don't see me for a while, that's because I'm uh, deep in research and study, and I'm actually trying to put everything together for the video as far as the production and the editing, the segues, the music. So I'm researching and I'm gathering all that up. So, again, I'd like to thank you for tuning in and learning with me. And without any further ado, Claim of Thrones 2.
In the first quarter of the 20th century, archaeologists began to unearth the remains from under tons of volcanic rock. What they encountered was a piece of history 2,000 years old, totally unspoiled. The disaster had struck the people of Pompeii so suddenly that everything stayed just as it had been 2,000 years ago, as if time had stood still. Despite the terrible eruption of Vesuvius, nobody fled, but just turned into stone where they stood. The faces, and even the teeth of some of these bodies remained completely intact. The thing they almost all had in common was their expression of surprise and terror. A family eating together were petrified at that exact moment. Even the food on the table has been preserved. Just across the street from the brothel is a building known as the Hotel of the Christians. This building contains many small rooms, and it bears graffiti containing the word Christianos. Professor Rebecca Benefiel is an expert on graffiti in Pompeii. And we're heading into the atrium. This is called the Hotel of the Christians, partly because there are many small rooms around the atrium, so it's thought that this could have served as some sort of hospitality establishment, but of the Christians, because very early on in 1862, there was discovered a very enigmatic graffito. But there's this one word that has fascinated everyone, Christianos. Because it was written in charcoal, it just needed a few rains and some sun, and it disappeared within two years. But in the short time between its discovery and its disappearance, there was only time for two experts to make tracings of it. So everyone has been working off of these tracings that were done in 1862. Then it would be the earliest archaeological attestation to the word Christian anywhere. Christianos, yeah, as, as an identity. Now, the problem was that nobody could make heads or tails of it, correct? Pretty much. There's a lot of writing, obviously. It's more than one word but the writing around it seems to be pretty puzzling. Uh, and gibberish. So in 1926, Professor Newbold comes up with the idea that, that what? Comes up with the idea that we have an inscription that mentions Christianos that is transliterated Aramaic, and it's written in Latin characters. To find the meaning, you swap the Latin letters for Aramaic letters. When you do that, you know, I can even understand from modern Hebrew, it says, a strange mind has overtaken A, doesn't mention who A is, who is now being held as a prisoner among the Christians. Before converting to Christianity, A was probably a regular user of the neighboring brothel, but he stopped after converting to Christianity. His former friends wrote this graffiti because they could not understand his change of heart. Pacchio Procolo was a baker in Pompeii, and archaeological evidence shows that he was a Christian. The evidence includes graffiti, the removal of pagan symbols, a satyr square, and the display of a Christian cross. 
Professor James Tabor describes the graffiti that was found at the entrance of the house. You always want to start with what's the clearest, and this is a kerem, C-H-E-R-E-M, is a transliteration of a Hebrew word. And it's often in the Hebrew Bible, the Old Testament. So it's always used for divine retributions, this blotting out. And then poinium, it's written in Latin. It's an attempt to represent a Greek word, poine, a blow or a strike. Ponium cherem means to strike with utter destruction. Exactly. And these are the five-pointed stars, Solomonic, as if to bring power to a kind of a curse, maybe. This curse acted as an amulet to ward off the immoral activity that was rampant in Pompeii. The same building that contains this graffiti, originally displayed pagan sexual imagery. The baker, who wrote the graffiti, covered up the pagan imagery with plaster. This plaster is now mostly faded, but it can still be seen. This is evidence that the baker was not a pagan, but was a Christian. In the same bakery, archaeologists discovered a Christian cross, in the form of graffiti, above the oven. The graffiti no longer exists, but a sketch was made and published. The same house also contained a Seder square found near the Biblical curse graffiti. The Seder square is a word square containing a Latin palindrome featuring the words Seder, ar repo, tenet, opera, and rotas. The Seder square is commonly acknowledged as a Christian symbol. They have been found in many locations throughout Western Europe, including Greece, Italy, Spain, Portugal, Germany, Austria, Hungary and Syria. In all cases, they were found at Christian sites. Dr. Finkel comments on the Seder Square. The likelihood is that it's an early Christian device in which they wanted to write the words Pater Noster in such a way that it wasn't obvious that that's what it was. A second Seder Square was also uncovered in Pompeii. This square has a Christian fish symbol above it. The Christian fish symbol, also called Dicthes, is a widely recognized symbol of Christianity. Herculaneum is a nearby city that was also buried in the eruption. Archaeologists uncovered the clear imprint of a Christian cross that had been nailed to the wall. An altar was placed in front of the cross. This find provides further evidence of Christianity in Pompeii, in the year 79 AD. These Dorians of Greece crossed from Asia Minor, Western Asia into ancient Alpia, Mysia, and Sparta. These Dorians were Danites, right? And the men of Judah, of the line of Darda. Darda was an Israelite, uh, this, uh, descendant of um, Dan, or they were also called Dardanians. So it tells you, hence, the wonderful Doric structures of Europe came largely from the skilled minds of the master masons and mechanics of the Danites.
Everything has been erased. Lost forever. As you know, we have no chapter at Adams College, which is why I've agreed to see you. But I must tell you, gentlemen, you have very little chance of becoming trilands. I'm in a difficult situation here. I mean, after all, you're nerds. The Spartans used the Greek letter lambda displayed on their shields as identification for their people, Lambda. L was used as the Spartans to represent Lacedaemon, the home state of their people. I'm going to jump to the point. The Dan colonists of Laish, Israelites, became the Danites of the north, known to names of Dan, Dardan and the Danes. Mm -hmm. So it shows you these names, Israelites, that went up in there and became the Dardanians. We just read Darda coming out of that history. The great Danes of Europe, the Danish. Look at this. These Dorians were Danites and men of Judah of the line of Darda. See? Or Danans of Argos. The Danans, the Danai. Okay?
Thank you for joining me. Watch me disprove Christianity. Wars as Antichrist. In fact, the name Chris Rock is a reference to Christ the Rock. See 1 Corinthians chapter 10 verse 4 in Psalm 18.2. Which... Psalm 18.2 states, the Lord is my rock. In the Old Testament, the Lord of Israel is the Most High God. The Lord God of all is also the Most High God. This person is blaspheming. And this is the entire problem with black Christians. Now, very easily, I'll just show you. The Israelites were destroyed. Only a remnant left to go forward into the next phase. Let me show you. Who created Christianity? Judah. What the? Who created Christianity? Judah. Who created Christianity? Judah. And this is why he was destroyed. This is why you do not have a city of or a town of, or a nation of Judeans today. They turn their back on the Most High and worship something that they themselves created. I'm going to read it to you right here. Your Jesus that you worship today, created by the Israelites, was hung on a cross. He sat next to a thief and a murderer. These different descriptions are right here. As the thief is ashamed, when he is found, so is the house of Israel ashamed. They their kings now who is the house of israel that is the central south american kingdoms and their families spread throughout the americas because they did what they allowed the canaanites to stay and when magog came over they made it with magog that's why it says that the siberian dna is a, B, C, or D, and the black person's DNA is E1, B1. They're telling you every time they say E1, B1, that that B represents the Siberian. So, as the thief is ashamed when he is found, so is the house of Israel ashamed. They, their kings, their princes, and their priests and their prophets saying to a stock stocks grow straight up out of the ground That's a corn stock, i.e. the scarecrow, saying to a scarecrow, thou art my father. Now, if you were the creator and you created the Israelites, and they were telling some freaking corn stock 
you're my daddy, wouldn't you wipe their ass off the face of the earth? Only leaving a remnant of them to be what? Captured by who the Most High himself calls the enemy. So, this is it. Thou art my father, and to a stone, the stone that the builder refused, right? If you're saying Psalms 18 and 2 says Christ, it does not. The Lord is not Christ. This is what? Isaiah 43. I have redeemed thee the, by my name. Thou art mine, the Lord. Who is the Lord? Hmm? Even if you go by Jehovah, that ain't Christ. If you are a reader and you understand the law, you were given a name. I am that I am forever. That's the English version. If you translate it, translate that back to Hebrew, that's Haya Haya. Like you always hear the Indians, hey yeah 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 hey yeah yeah. But you want to worship a stalk. Let's go back to why these people today will be destroyed. 26, 2 and 26, and 27 and 28. As the thief is ashamed when he is found, so is the house of Israel ashamed. They, their kings, their princes, their priests, their prophets. Where's the Israelite kings today? Where are the prophets today? That's what I thought. Their descendants are still alive. Saying to a stock, a scarecrow, you my daddy, staying to a stone that the builder refused, thou hast brought me forth. For they have turned their back unto me and not their face. But in time of their trouble. Hmm? They will they will they will say, Arise and save us. But where are thy gods that thou hast made? The Israelites created Christ. That's why they've been handed over. See? If, let them rise. If they can save thee in the time of thy trouble. Where was Jesus during colonization? Where was the serpent that we, that, that we worshipped, huh? That we allegedly worshipped. The Bible say we did it. I, I don't know about it. I'm just saying Where were they? Where was the, the stone the builder refused when we were going through our great trouble? Still continuing today. See, this is what the Most High said. So when we go to Isaiah, this gives it all away. Now, thus saith the Lord, I created thee. Jesus didn't create anything. He came from a vagina. Of a, of a, of a, of a JJ. He didn't create anything. I am the Lord thy God, the Holy One of Israel. Jesus didn't talk about no Israel. The Lord, thy God, is the Holy One of Israel, thy Savior. I gave Egypt for thy ransom. 
Jesus didn't have anything to do with the Israelites in Egypt. So how can this man say all these things? This is the greatest blasphemy of all. And all these melanated people just don't get it. Did they lose their mind? Did they forget they know how to read? Black people are drunk. With death. It's a fascinating, fascinating dinner date. Greetings and happy returns. As with all of my video productions, I try to share as much information as possible without overwhelming time and attention. I have some very interesting research that I like to share. And in the interest of time, I'll just scratch the surface and touch on some of it. It's a lot to cover in a short span of time. So I'll set off a few sparks, and I urge you to do some further research and investigation to dig deeper. In part one, we learn some of the true history about a few of the ancient European cultures and civilizations, such as the Greeks,
the Minoans. The Messinians. The Dardanians, who were the Trojans. And the Lacedaemonians, who were the Spartans. The Cretans or Gamantes of Libya before the continent became known as Africa. The ancient Etruscans of Italy. and the original Romans of Edom. who were also known as the Holy Roman Empire. the Holy Roman Empire, which most notably consisted of the Kingdom of Germany the Kingdom of Bohemia, now Czechoslovakia, the Kingdom of Gaul and Burgundy, now France, and the Kingdom of Italy.
Constantinople, Emperor Constantine's New Rome, became a Christian city of immense wealth, amazing art, and magnificent architecture. But before Christianity was the worship of the Roman Byzantine Empire, which was ultimately conquered by the Ottomans in 1453, I want to share some very interesting information on the origins of Christianity that will challenge indoctrinated belief and provide some more historical perspective. As we research and further analyze the history during the time or time frame of the beginning of the current or Christian era, we begin to see the origins and the creation of Christianity and its practices dated as early as A.D. 79 in Pompeii. A.D. or Anno Domini from Latin meaning in the year of our Lord. Over two centuries later, we began to see the works of the church and state and the deification of Serapis Christus, or Jesus Christ, as the Son of the Most High and as a God equal to the Most High. The cult of Serapis was introduced during the 3rd century BCE or before the coming of Christian era on the orders of Pharaoh Ptolemy I Sotar of the Ptolemaic Kingdom as a means to unify the Greeks and the Egyptians in his realm. The cultus of Serapis was spread as a matter of deliberate policy by the Ptolemaic kings, who also built the immense Serapium of Alexandria. The worship of Serapis continued to increase in popularity during the Roman Empire 
often replacing Osiris as the consort of Isis in temples outside Egypt. In the primitive or early church, the term Christ was originally just a title. It is said that the title of Christ was also applied to ancient rulers of Israel and Judah. The word entitled Christ comes from the Greek word Christos, which means anointed one. In the Greek Septuagint, Christos was used to translate the Hebrew word Messiah or Mashiach, meaning Messiah or anointed, which is a title said to be adopted from the word Messi, which was a term associated with the traditional of anointing the Egyptian pharaoh during coronation or marriage with oil drawn from the fat of Messi, the Egyptian word for crocodile. The ancient Egyptians used to anoint with crocodile fat. Thus, the Egyptian word Messi was the sacred crocodile or crocodile star in the spells and the same anointing ritual may be traced to early Mesopotamian Musuhishu. The Musuhishu is a creature from ancient Mesopotamian mythology. It is a hybrid beast, part scaly dragon, with hind legs resembling the talons of an eagle, with the feline forelegs, a long neck and tail, a horn head with a snake like tongue. The Meshuhushu most famously appears on the reconstructed Ishtar gate of the city of Babylon, dating to the 6th century BC or before the coming of Christian era. In coffins of Egyptian mummies, the word K-R-S-T, Christ, is found as a blessing and anointing from Horus and Osiris. Hence the word Christos is thought to be loaned, or its original origin is Egyptian. K-R-S-T, Christ, means the process of the preparation of the mummy by embalming, purifying, and anointing, and can mean anointed buried or covered in oil. So according to Egyptian history, the modern words Messiah and Christ derive from Messi, which was a sacred crocodile or crocodile star and KRST, Christ, which means the process of embalming a mommy. At the Council of Nicaea in the year A.D. 325 or the year 325 of the common or Christian era, under Emperor Constantine and Bishop Hoseus, Serapis Christus, the Egyptian god, became Iosis Christus, the Christian god. During the late Renaissance era in the 17th century, Iosis Christus was renamed to Jesus Christ which is also after the letter J was added to the alphabet. 
Also interesting to note, often left out of this history is Saint Athanasius, nicknamed the Black Dwarf. Born in the Roman province of Alexandria, Egypt, and he was called the Black Dwarf because he was short and dark-skinned. At the Council of Nicaea in A.D. 325, the controversy centered on the nature of what would become Jesus Christ. Arius, a priest in Libya, declared that there was a time when the Son was not. He specifically wrote, If the Father begat the Son, then he who was begotten had a beginning in existence. And from this it follows, there was a time when the Son was not. Athanasius said that the Son was eternal. He was the same stuff as God the Father. Just as the Father is eternal, so is the Son. Word of the dispute made it to the Emperor Constantine, who wanted a unified church. So to settle the matter, he called a council of bishops. Ultimately, the council condemned Arius, the Libyan priest, as a heretic, exiled him, and made it a capital offense to possess his writings. Constantine was pleased that the peace had been restored to the church. Athanasius, whose treatise on the Incarnation laid the foundation for the Orthodox party at Nicaea, was hailed as the noble champion of Christ. A point of interest is that both Arius and Athanasius were from Libya and Egypt, countries that are located in what is known today as the continent of Africa. And they were depicted and described in history as dark-skinned people as were the many Holy Roman Empire and Byzantine images of Christ. The Clergy and other biblical figures such as the Israelites. It is very important to note that before the Renaissance era, the images of all of these people were depicted as swarthy, dark-skinned, or richly melanated throughout Europe.
Keep it in mind the timeline. According to the world map by Herodotus in 430 BC or before the coming of Christian era, until the Punic Wars or the series of three wars fought between Rome and Carthage from 264 BC to 146 BC. In the Second Punic War, the great Carthaginian general Hannibal invaded Italy and scored great victories at Lake Tresemene and Cannae before its eventual defeat at the hands of Rome's Africanus in 202 BC or before the coming of Christian era. After Hannibal was defeated, Carthage, which was the capital city in the region of Tunisia, was then referred to and named Africa. Carthage and the region of Tunisia were the only locations on the continent that were known as Africa. Cartographer Sebastian Monster also records this fact on the first official map of the continent in the 1500s. Before it gradually became known as such centuries later, by way of Indo-European colonization, there was no continent called Africa. The word, name, and location did not exist in history until after the Carthage or Punic Wars. Again, I can't stress enough the importance of the historical timeline and how crucial this information is for us to know when many of these events occurred, the people involved, who is who, what is what, how and why, and when and where. As we learn in Claim of Thrones Part 1, according to the historical account, Alexander the Great ordered the construction of a wall between the mountains of the Caucasus to seal and lock away the tribes of Gog and Magog.
which included the tribes of the Alemanni, who were a confederation of barbarian tribes and the ancestors of the Indo-European tribes. It is very important to note the irony and the self-actualization of the term Indo-European. Indo meaning I put, set or placed into or upon Europe. I insert my kind and kinsmen I instill and introduce my sense of superiority and privileged nature. Endo. Endo figuratively means I impart or give to, apply to, impose on, attach to. I name after or for. I bestow. The barbaric and nomadic Indo-Europeans emerged from the steppes of the Siberian plains in the Caucasus regions during the 3rd to the 5th centuries of the common or Christian era and invaded Europe. The Alemanni claimed the throne of the Roman province of Germania in the 3rd century of the common or Christian era and became known as the Germanic tribes. And they called themselves the Germans after hijacking the name from the Romans of Germania. Several of these now Germanic tribes or early Indo-Europeans branched off into sub-tribes. As we look at the invasions and usurps of the kingdoms and lands that were claimed by the ancestral Indo-Europeans, we can see who their descendants are today. The Germans who invaded Burgundy and called themselves the Burgundians are now the Swiss. The Franks who invaded Gaul, which became France, are now the French. Thank you.
the Lombards who invaded Italy are today's Italians. The Angles, Frisians, and Jutes who invaded Britain are now the English.
the Suave are now the Portuguese. The Visigoths are now the Spaniards. and other Germans like the Hurli, Ostrogoths, and Vandals also invaded the lands in the Mediterranean region and North Africa and were ultimately absorbed and assimilated into the ruling cultures of the regions. Now based on the recorded accounts, the historical timeline tells us the specific lands and regions where these people originated from and inhabited. From the steppes of the Siberia plains to the Caucasus regions and how these people were nomadic, known as barbarians, very warlike, and when they left the Siberian steppes and the Caucasus regions and began invading and usurping Europe and Asia and ultimately invading, migrating, and usurping throughout the earth. Based on the historical accounts, there are several significant barbarian invasions to provide us a historical timeline of the invasions and usurps or claim of many of the once melanated and swarthy kingdoms and thrones of Europe. Oh. 
As we look at the many invasions and usurps committed by these barbarian tribes throughout history, we can now see who they were and who the descendants of these people are today. According to the historical accounts, Gog, Magog, and the ancestors of today's Germanic or Indo-Europeans were sealed behind a great wall between the Caucasus Mountains by Alexander the Great before his death in 323 BC or before the common or Christian era. During the 3rd, 4th, and 5th centuries CE or the common or Christian era, barbarian tribes of Germanic peoples invaded Western Europe and Great Britain, as well as Italy, Spain, Gaul, and North Africa. And the settlements of these nomadic or wandering barbaric people became fixed territories after usurping the kingdoms and castles and claiming the thrones of the once melanated and swarthy nobles and monarchs of Europe. Now, as I stated in part one, the people of the Nord, or the barbarian tribes of Indo-Europeans, had no alphabet or written language before they invaded Europe and Asia. This is very important to keep in mind as we began to see the pattern of these barbaric and nomadic people claiming the thrones and naming themselves after the lands that they usurp. In the 3rd century of the common or Christian era, the Alemanni, meaning all men or men united, a confederation of several barbarian tribes, captured the Roman province of Germania in the year 260. And these barbarian and nomadic tribes from the north named themselves the Germans after seizing Germania from the Romans. In the Battle of Adrianopolis, one of these now dramatic tribes that usurped the Roman province of Germania, the Visigoths, defeated the imperial army of Byzantium and attacked Constantinople in the year 378. In the year 409, Germans known as the Vandals, Alans, and Suave invaded Spain. Then in the year 410, the Germans known as the Angles Frisians and Jutes invaded Britain and ultimately established control over modern day England. And during the same time, the Visigoths were invading Italy and Spain. In the year 411, Another Germanic Vandalic tribe of barbarians invaded and seized the settlements of Barbatogamus, present day Worms, and Spire in Germany, and Strasbourg in France. However, before this time period, the regions of what is now France were known as Gaul and Burgundy. Once the lands of the Adui, the ancient indigenous Celtic tribe of Central Gaul.
In the fourth century, a barbarian Vedelic tribe of Germans invaded and seized Burgundy and they called themselves the Burgundians. In the 5th century, another barbaric tribe of Germans called the Merovingians or Franks invaded France. And in the year 534, the Franks conquered Burgundy and drove out the Burgundians, who finally settled in the Western Alps of the Jura mountain chain in Switzerland and called themselves the Swiss. The Burgundian kingdom then became part of the Merovingian or Frankish kingdoms after the Germans, called the Franks, invaded and usurped Gaul or ancient France, and today they call themselves the French. Then the Visigoths invaded Iberia in the year 418. And in the year 425, the Vandals pillaged and plundered the Balearic Islands, sacking Spain, the Western Mediterranean Sea, Hispania, and Mauritania, or present-day Northwest Africa. Then in the year 429, the Vandals invaded the Roman province of Africa Proconsularis and the regions of North Africa and seized Carthage. Then the Vandals sacked Rome in the year 455 and plundered the city for two weeks. It is said that our word vandalism stems from this event. Also during the 5th century, the German tribe called the Suave invaded Portugal and converted to Catholic Christianity. In the 6th century, the Visigoths take control of Spain and convert to Catholicism in the year 589. Today, many of the Visigoth and Suave descendants are known as the Spaniards and the Portuguese. Oh. 
another group of Germans known as the Lombards, also known as Legobard or Langobards, meaning long beard, left Scandinavia and crossed the Alps and began invading the Byzantine controlled region of northern Italy in 568. So as we can see, according to history, the majority of the invasions by the people from the north or nord into Europe took place in the 5th century. And the people from the north were historically described as barbarians, savages, unsophisticated, illiterate, with no written language, warlike, and pagan. Interesting to note, the genetic history of Indo-Europeans confirmed that both East and West Eurasians were early exposed to significant Neanderthal admixture. According to the oldest modern European DNA samples, the Indo-Europeans, as well as today's so-called Native Americans, have Neanderthal DNA. And some of the oldest samples were found in the Denisova cave in Siberia. According to scientists, the Siberian ancestry reached the coast of the Baltic Sea no later than the mid-first millennium BC or before the coming of Christian era around the time of the diversification of West Uralic and Finnic languages. It also indicates an influx of people from regions with strong Western hunter-gatherer characteristics in the Bronze Age. According to many traits we now associate with modern Northern Europeans like pale skin, blue eyes, and lactose tolerance. Today, the vast majority of the Siberian population, over 95%, is Slavic and other Indo-European ethnicities, mainly Russians, Ukrainians, and Germans. Over 500 years after being sealed away behind the Great Wall in the Caucasus Mountains, barbarians or the people of the Nord, known as the Northern or Nordic people, began invading and settling into the regions of Scandinavia and the three kingdoms of Denmark, Norway, and Sweden.
Barbarians or the people of the Nord, known as the Northern or Nordic people, began invading and settling into the regions of Scandinavia and the three kingdoms of Denmark, Norway, and Sweden.
the myriad of skin tones and eye colors that humans express around the world are interesting and wonderful in their variety. Research continues on how humans acquired the trait they now have and when, in order to complete the puzzle that is our ancient human history. Now, a recent analysis by anthropologists suggests that the light skin color and the tallness associated with European genetics are relatively recent traits to the continent. An international team of researchers is headed by Harvard University's Dr. Ian Matheson put forth a study at the 84th annual meeting of the American Association of Physical Anthropologists recently. Based on 83 human samples from Holocene Europe as analyzed under the 1000 Genomes Project, it is now found that for the majority of the time that humans have lived in Europe, the people had dark skin, and the genes signifying light skin only appear within the past 8000 years. This recent and relatively quick process of natural selection suggests to researchers that the traits which spread rapidly were advantageous within that environment, according to the American Association for the Advancement of Science. This dramatic evidence suggests modern Europeans do not appear as their long ancient ancestors did. This is the face of master artist Higemon, 17th century Austrian master artist. I don't have a lot of his paintings, but these are images that we should be familiar with. All people should be, should be familiar with. Another master artist here. That picture I just showed you was from J. Rogers, Nature No No Color Line. This is here's a highly celebrated portrait entitled Juan de Parja, the 17th century Spanish artist Diego Velasquez. It's by him. This is painted by. Diego Velasquez. In the Spanish language, Parja means partner. So it is possible that Juan was also an artist, Velasquez, who was commissioned to do a portrait of the Roman Catholic Pope. Did this portrait of Juan as preparation for the commission. You can find this picture 
and many books I'm going to show you later on. Here are some other ancient black people that are master artists that I've accumulated over the years. You're going to see some of their art in this tape. Dionysus, black Russian icons, Andre Rublev, Jean Fouquet, French artist, Arnolfo Di Cambio, Diego Velasquez, Juan de Parja, as we just saw, Hans Memlein, Higemont, Theo Payne's the Greek, Fabulous, the prophet Luke, or the apostle Luke from the Bible. Also Mohawk, Indian brother John Fadden, and also Isaiah is not written on this list. These are names that we should be familiar with as master artists. Here's a piece that someone gave me years ago. I don't know what the source comes from, but it's a picture when you go in John the fifth chapter one to nine, it's the time when the waters of Bethesda were troubled and moved by the angel. And if you were there and you were in the water, you were healed of all ailments. Check out this picture. Check out the master art. Here are the Israelite Jews, the Hebrews, with Mary and the baby Jesus in the middle. Here's the pool, and here's all the people coming for healing. Here's the walls of Jerusalem in the background. This is how the lords and the kings and the barons drew the people of the Bible before the Renaissance period when much of the art was Caucasianized, I should say. Who created Christianity? Judah. Now I want to go back in history around 4th century AD. First, I want to. This is from, this is a book I have where I've gathered many icons from many books that I've gathered throughout the years. I'm gonna give you a quick shot of some of these books. I'm gonna show it to them, show them to you later on. All these books I'm gonna go through in this tape. Money that I can't get on this tape. As you see, here's Christ and the twelve disciples. And the Hebrew Israelite priest here holding a stick of frankincense and myrrh. He was 4th century, during the same time as Constantine, a little bit after, of St. Nicholas, who today America and the world is corrupted to Santa Claus. St. Nicholas. Bought this on the street. He was a black man. And this represents the Indian nations who are also Hebrew. You see the little black sheep, little sheep down here. And the Last Supper of Christ right here which is a Passover supper. Here's some more books over here. I'm going to be going through these books as I go through this tape. But in Rome, you'll find Constantine's the Great, born in Nice, Yugoslavia, 
you're going to see a woolly head picture of an Israelite Jew that took over the Roman Empire and had whites in slavery or banished to the Caucasus Mountains of South Georgia, Russia, 306 to 307 AD. He did away with the pagan Roman democratic way and established the Bible as law in the known world. Notice the arrow on the arch. There's an arch of Constantine. The area is enlarged to reveal the Negroid Jewish conquerors of the Roman Empire. So you see this is the Arch of Constantine. It's in the Rome today. Hopefully it's still there and they haven't disrupted the face of Constantine. I'm going to show you right here. If you see this, where the arrow's at. Now I'm going to go down here to another book. And you see this area right here that is enlarged. And you'll see Constantine teaching the people. That's what it says. Constantine Relief, Constantine Addresses to People. These are all black people. And this was painted back then, too. You can't get by this. These are all woolly-haired people. In the face of Constantine. I'm going to show you another book with the same statue. So you see, this is not nothing I just made up. So now I'm going to go back again so you can see. It's another book I got this from. I'll give you the name of that book later on. This area is blown up. This is the Arch of Constantine right here. Okay. Now I want to show you this book. It's one book that I got this from. It's another book. Now this is supposed to be the face of Constantine. Now how does this look like the one I just showed you? Now you look inside the book and you'll find this is a Renaissance picture of Constantine and you'll find a coin here. It doesn't quite look the same. Okay. Now let's turn the page and see this is what is this relief from the arch of Constantine showing people no longer individualized listening to his speech in the form Romanium the relief is over the left hand arch on the north side so you can see here is the arch of Constantine and here is another angle of Constantine the Great. It's another book now. The other source I showed you, I forgot where that book come from, the name of the book, but this book just shows you Constantine the Great, teaching the people. Looks totally different from the picture I showed you before. Kind of looks like Joe Jackson, Michael Jackson's father, a little bit. Get a look at that. We have a great history. We have to show all people the truth. It's going to hurt. It's going to make people mad. But I really, I really don't care. It's time that this stuff comes out. Constantine the Great by Michael Grant. Let's get some more information from this book that I've compiled of images of Constantine. And where he moved to Turkey. This is from J.A. Rogers. This is uh, in Turkey, which used to be called Constantinople. And this is an image right here. Detail of Turkish harem, seen by J.L. Jerome, 1824-1904. This is later Constantinople. This is how we were living. I'm just showing you the picture. Okay. This is from March 2005, U.S. News and World Report, Special Edition, page 43. Turning Point, the Council of Nicaea met in 325 A.D. in the Constantine's Watchful Eye. Look at this icon of how 
they drew this picture at this time. It's an icon drawn around this time, 5th century, 4th century AD. Notice Constantine right here, how he's drawn. And that's his mother, Helena, strong black woman. She went back down to Israel and gathered many holy relics, took a whole entourage on in an army and gathered many holy relics of Christ. You know, the spear that stabbed him, the cross, and many other relics she gathered. This is the council. This is how the council was. I'm not even going to say anything. Here's Mary and Christ right here. Some of the priests. Here's Christ, pictures of Christ that they brought with them. Okay. This has to come out. It's time now for this to come out. Here's another forgery. There was many artists especially during the Roman times and up until the Renaissance was a very evil time where they would find black art and desecrate it and they would make other statues. This is a very fresh, this could have been done 100 years ago. And this is the one you see, this is supposed to be Constantine. Don't look nothing like the one I just showed you. That's the lie. This is a Roman warlord and his retainers. Detail from a late 4th century mosaic at Pizza a Marini a Marini a Marina. Got to pronounce that right. A Marina, Sicily. Black people. This right here. This is Days of Wrath. This is out of a um, let me say this is National Geographic, December 1983, Byzantine Empire. Constantine ruled what you call today Turkey. It's called Constantinople. Istanbul means city of Constantinople. This is where Constantine ruled from, ruled the whole Christian world. And this, this is what happened here. They have wrath for Eastern Christians to depict it on Roman, Romanian fresco came on May 29th, 1453, when Constantinople fell after a seven-week siege by Mohammed II. 100,000 Ottoman troops who were white convert Muslim Arabs and real brown-skinned Arabs, they got together. Manned by 8,000 defenders. We only had 8,000 men that were defending Christian, black, Negroes, Israelites. Defenders, the walls proved invincible to the large cannons, largest cannons the world had yet seen until a lightly guarded portal offered a way in. I want you to get a good shot of this. This is the castle of Constantinople and the city of Constantinople in its fall. This is when we begin to lose our power. And you can see the defenders of the city. Picture of Christ, here's the women. The queen, at that time it was Constantine Pelagos, the 11th from Constantine the Great himself that we just saw. Here's some defenders, some um, archers. Afros, really here, brown skin. This is probably Constantine Pelagos right here, the 11th, the last ruler. There was an eight-foot Thracian named Hassan who fought on the walls of Constantinople. Constantinople. Powerful fighter. So this is the fall of Constantinople right here. Here's some more archers and defenders. As you see, here's the Ottoman Turks. You got some Arab women now. You see the cathedral there now. I'm going to show you some of that in this, in this piece. Here's another one. Mysteries of History. Okay. Here we go. 
page 74, U.S. News and Special Edition. Okay. And here's one of the saints during Constantine's time. This is on, I'll show it to you in color. Right here. You see? You should get a good look at these people. See, what people understand is that blacks root Europe for a thousand years. They're called the Dark Ages. They don't want you to know this. Blacks in America, there's a media blackout. And blacks should not know their true history. Okay, this is from the uh, public library picture catalog. This right here, I think, is um, Constantine and Helena, his mother. It's been whitewashed, covered up a little bit. Pain is lost, but you can see the woolly here. You know these are black people because we just seen the other pictures. You see there's not long flowing hair. These are woolly haired people. pictures here. Let's go through my archives. I want y'all to see this stuff. Let me read this. Is, this is a page from um, J. Rogers, Nation of North Carolina. Let's see what he says here. Such prejudice, prejudices as existed against race in the matter of marriage were directed chiefly against the fair whites to the north because they were considered heathen. Constantine the Great issued strict orders against even the marriage of their princes with his people. Negro soldiers who had been coming into Greece from about the 10th century BC continued to arrive into the war of the Greek independence in 1830. You can read on down. This gives you a little history of what happened in Turkey from Constantine time up until it was called Turkey when the Ottoman Turks took it over and called it Turkey today. Now it's a Muslim state. Okay. 